Uh, we are here today at the May 2022 edition of Opening the Box, and it's the latest installment in the series of programs where we highlight one of or several, one or several of the collections uh, held here at the Richardson Sloan Special Collections Center of the Davenport Public Library. Uh, my name is Katie Reinhardt. I'm the Special Collections Librarian. And I will be your guide this month as we discuss research collections in our collection. So what do I mean by a research collection? Well, it differs from the other archival collections that we have in that it's not a record that is produced by an individual or group that serves as a primary source, examples being uh, the personal letters of Antoine Leclerc, or meeting minutes of a local organization like the Ladies Industrial Relief Society, um, to use some examples. Uh, instead, is that it is all the sources gathered together by a researcher or researchers to write a book, to pre prepare a presentation, et cetera, on a specific topic. So it's an uninterpreted set of historical materials that allow new research to either come to different conclusions about the same topic using the sources um, or for researchers to pursue a different but related topic without needing to do as much leg, leg work, such as the tedium of scanning for pages of newspapers on the microphone for a, for a certain need. Um, so a research collection can suggest other types of sources that you might look at and also suggest for research that you might find on a similar topic. And it also serves as a record of the research of and the research techniques used by members of our own QC community. So today I'll be discussing three research collections in our collection that happen to address from different angles, the same topic, the African American community in Africa. So the first collection was compiled by Craig Klein of Scott Community College. He has had a long-term interest in assessing the nature and extent of the black community in Davenport, writing a 1998 paper on the black experience in early 20th century Davenport and also in mapping the locations of African-American residences and businesses in the city from the mid 19th to the early 20th century. In addition to these studies, we are fortunate to have received from him sets of references, abstracts, excerpts, and copies of documents about several subtopics, including African-American business and professional women, African-American churches and fraternal organizations, the Bethel AME Church in particular, the celebration of the emancipation holidays in the Tri-Cities, and the colored school controversy in Davenport. They are all nicely organized into booklets with title pages, and we've cataloged them and they are available on our open shelf, but we're still considering them as one collection. So for both the list of early African-American business and professional women and his collection on uh, churches and fraternal organizations, he has pulled entries out of the city directories. So here's an example of materials um, we have from the 1900s city directories where um, he's, he's pulled out um, Maddie Hedden and Mrs. Lottie King as dressmakers and um, Anna Haggins as a, one of the boarding house keepers. So 
so um, he had to go through directories and just look for at this part of particular part of the directory, which is a business directory, and look for uh, women with the with the word col for colored in parentheses. Uh, so now, if you want to know something about these women, you don't have to go through all the directories yourself. <laughs> uh, so it's a good place, uh, just starting place for doing additional research. Um, so, and um, he also realized that you can find in the listings for residences, women in their residences, sometimes they had their businesses in their home. So he could find additional ones uh, in the residential listings. So um, he includes those along with the ones that are in the business directory. So that's just a reminder to researchers that that's another way to uncover uh, information about women in particular in this case. Um, and then uh, he also collected information on churches and fraternal organizations from the city directories. Uh, here we have uh, the Third Baptist Church um, pointed out and also the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church called the African Methodist Episcopal Church. This is in the 1910 directory. And we also have uh, women's church societies, the Ladies Sewing Society of the AME Church and the Lend a Hand Club of the Third Baptist Church on the right, on the left, and on the right we have the fraternal organizations under the separate category of color, colored, uh, the Harem Lodge of the Masons and the Eureka Lodge of the Odd Fellows. And also under those are listed the uh, women's auxiliaries. So another type of source that uh, Craig Klein has already gathered for us in our research is um, uh, excerpts from local newspapers. This is an uh, 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 item from the Davenport Daily Gazette talking about the organization of the AM Church. And this is again from his set of materials about the, the AME church in particular, an article from the Davenport Democrat um, where the so-called race problem is addressed by the uh, AME's, the Bethel AME's church, uh, Reverend Christie. And he not only looked he not only looked for information about Davenport in the local newspapers, but there was also a source called the Iowa State Bystander that was published in Des Moines. And they had a special section called Davenport Notes. So here's a notice about the funeral of Sister Jenny Valentine of the AME Church. And so there's lots of information about specific individuals in these Davenport notes. And you can also compare what's going on uh, in the African-American community in Davenport to other communities that are reporting to the central um, bystander as a, as a publication, a central publication. And here's just a look at one of the early, earlier editions. Uh, it began publication in 1894. So in his set, also in his set of materials um, for the Tri-City Emancipation Holidays, that was a holiday that where the the African-American community would 
celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation, or before that, they would celebrate the day that the West Indian slaves were freed. Um, so this happened at different times during the year, depending on the year. Sometimes it was in September. I think it was usually in September, but I found references to it happening in January too. So um, anyway, Craig Klein has documented in uh, the local newspapers all, all of the ins instances where Emancipation Days was celebrated. And in his, um, he also looked at a particular event for the African-American community in Davenport, which was the colored school controversy. And um, he excerpts some minutes of the Davenport Board of Education meetings, uh, which he obtained from the Davenport Publics, the Davenport School Museum and also provides us with a photo of the, uh, what was called then the Stone Schoolhouse at the corner of 7th and Perry. That was um, where, the, where the college students were expelled from. And then the second collection that I'd like to talk about is Karen or um, research file on African American Davenport or Milky. Uh, she has plans to eventually publish a detailed genealogy, but along the way, she is graciously sharing with us the items she's finding. Uh, so this is how it, this is how all her folders look right now. Um, So uh, her focus is the family relationship. So she started out with her own personal family documents, um, such as this photograph. And Milton Howard is here. And that's his family um, in the latter part of his life. Uh, Karen, uh, um, is actually the descendant of Milton Howard. So it's her personal family history. And just a comment about uh, looking at the research collection for a single person in a fam single family, uh, that it can deepen our understanding of certain aspects of the African American community as a whole. Uh, making it an excellent complement to the material that Craig Klein has already collected. So in addition to items like this photograph, she started with um, stories that were passed down, information that was passed down to her orally. And she starts with Milton himself. Here he is um, at work at the Rock Island Arsenal. So she looks for traditional genealogy sources, such as um, city directories to find out where the family lived over time. So here is her record of that research. And so research collections like this can also show how a certain person keeps their work organized. And in this case, we're thankful because we've got all the years in the right order. And this is done with a very handy sheet provided by the Richardson Sloan Special Collections Center. <laughs> so, um, Milton Howard married several times. So she collected marriage certificates. So expanding out from Milton himself is of course the other families that joined his by marriage. And again, 
uh, Karen has summarized the five marriages here for a quick look. So that is useful to future researchers. And she has gathered together some interesting um, other corroborating documents like about the marriages like this um, affidavit in Scott County Court where a woman who witnessed the death of two of Milton Howard's wives in her one lifetime. Um, I think this was for maybe a divorce court or a pension application. Um, so very little is known about, or very little has been verified yet about um, Milton Howard's early life, which was quite eventful. He was um, kidnapped by all accounts uh, from his family in Muscatine um, and sold as a slave down south. Um, he was, he, he, but he was born uh, into a free African, African American family. So uh, Karen has also corrected, uh, collected information from newspapers. Um, the Arsenal record had a story about his early life. And of course, what she's heard from her own family members, and she's worked very hard to verify all these, these versions of the story or compare all these versions of the story to attempt to document the facts. So um, this is, oops. This is a pension records from the National Archive. And this is where um, he, he assigned this document. And it indicates that, you know, that he did sign into, he did sign, um, enlist in the US colored troops, the volunteer infantry. Um, at McGregor, Iowa, after he escaped from slavery in Alabama. And Karen has um, even been able to go deeper and she's discovered this deed record that verifies that Milton had been owned by Albert Pickett of Montgomery, Alabama. And of course, as she goes along, she finds documents that raise more questions. Uh, this is a passenger manifest from uh, going from a, a slave manifest uh, going from Mobile, Alabama to New Orleans. And it includes a child named Milton, who's about the right age, um, but she has no corroborating evidence and we're not sure why uh, a ship would be going from Mobile to New Orleans if eventually uh, he would have been sold to someone in, in Alabama. So more questions there. So she's also working to gather information like this newspaper article about um, the next generation of Howards in this area. This is um, the Daily Times profile of Private William Howard and his research into um, and his service in World War I. And she's even expanded uh, beyond the connections between family members to looking at friends and family, uh, uh, sorry, friends and neighbors. So she has a couple of folders labeled friends and neighbors. 
And this particular one, she's copied um, all of the information sheets from the census, the 1870 census in Davenport about all the colored, all the, they're called colored people then, but um, all of the black uh, people in Davenport. So that's going to be an extremely useful um, set of information that's already been collected for anyone researching African Americans in Davenport. And also helpful to future researchers is uh, the fact that she put these little finding guides to each of her folders. This one is a folder about um, uh, Levi Marlowe, who was a friend of Milton Howard's. So it lists um, all the census records, other uh, headstones. So you know, before you go through the whole folder, you know what you're looking at. So that is very useful too. And last but not least, we'll be talking about the what we call the Underground Railroad Research Collection at the center. So this was part of a project uh, to add Oakdale Cemetery or Oakdale Memorial Gardens to the National Underground Railroad Network. And the research was done by students from Arlington High School in Nebraska um, and also our own staff and volunteers. And I believe volunteers from Oakdale and volunteers from the Scott County, Iowa Genealogy Society, Genealogical Society. Uh, so they produced this guide to the graves of former slaves um, in the cemetery. And you can see included is Milton Howard. And they did lots and lots of research on each of these individuals. And even though it's condensed here into these short uh, biographies, uh, they actually um, have folders and folders for every single individual, not just in Scott County and not just connected with, this, uh, with a grave site, um, but with other African-Americans in um, in the surrounding counties in Iowa. So Clinton County, Muscatine County. And the material is organized alphabetically. So here are some of the individuals that were researched. Um, so there's a nice guide to who they were, a quick indication of uh, their religious affiliation, their political affiliation, whether they were pro or anti-slavery, uh, whether they were a former slave, um, and also that, that includes people like A.C. Fulton, who was a white man, but who was uh, an abolition uh, supporter of anti-slavery, as well as the former slaves themselves. And here's an example of by our own Carol, Karen O'Connor. She made a timeline here for the Busey family who buried at Oakdale. Um, and she also made on the right, uh, filled out a family unit chart. They collected uh, documents like this, I'm not sure. Uh, the will of Matilda Busey. And they looked in uh, sources like the history of Scott County for the list of 
uh, African Americans in the first African infantry unit, and that included Moses Bush, who's also in Oakdale, and it collected these information sheets like um, from the genealogical databases. And this is from Family Search. It's about his service in the Civil War. Uh, again, newspaper articles. This is Aunt Betty Lewis. And Scott County records. This is her death record. Um, and for the um, the white allies, we have um, information about Alfred Sanders, who was the editor of, of the anti-slavery publication, the Davenport Gazette. Um, and just some notes about his family, some newspaper articles, his obituary, ideas for what else to look for. And again, research and secondary sources like this book on, on the history of Iowa newspapers. And this, these are the pages for Scott County. So with all these, uh, research collections together um, that can be used over and over again for various different research projects on the history of the African-American community in Davenport. They're a great starting place for family histories, for histories about certain events and, and just the, the, Daven the, um, the, the extent and the changes in the community over time. So I hope you'll visit us here at Special Collections and take a look at these very unique research collections in our collection. Thank you very much. <laughs>